Cartwright Robinson is from the beautiful island of Turks and Caicos. Growing up, she was exposed to leadership roles from early. As she grew older, she became the Northern Director and President of the Caribbean Baptist Fellowship Youth Department and Vice President of the Baptist World Alliance Youth. Charlene has served on many influential bodies, such as the 10-Year Country Plan Committee, the Boundaries Commission, and the Constitution Review Body, just to name a few. Charlene has been the first female to hold the following positions, Secretary and President of the Kiwanis Club of Grand Turks, PDM Chairman, Deputy Leader, Leader of the Opposition, Chair of both Public Parliamentary Committees, the Public Accounts Committee, the first female Premier and Minister of Finance, just to name a few. While as Minister of Finance, Charlene has also had the opportunity to serve as the Chair of the Caribbean Development Board. In 2021, she retired from frontline politics. She has been honored by Women International also. In 2022, she was honored by the Caribbean Court of Justice as the youngest honoree among 33 female jurors in the region to positively impact her country and the Caribbean region. Her life has been documented in a book published in 2021 as a part of this honor. She currently serves as president of a British charity that supports British overseas territories and an advisor to the Caribbean Diaspora Association based in the Bahamas. She continues to serve her church through the Usher and Youth Ministry. Let's welcome Charlene Cartwright to Pathways to Success. Welcome to Pathway to Success. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Hunter, and I have the privilege of interviewing the Honorable Charlene Cartwright Robinson from the Turks, Caicos Island. She was the first female premier of the island, and um, we're so happy to have her on, um, on, on, our, on our show to, today to, to share with you her story uh, from her rise, from where she came from to where she's at now. Um, you're honorable. <laughs> yes, you're uh, excellent. How are you doing? I am wonderful. I'm blessed. Thank God. <laughs> great to have you on the show. Uh, uh, a great woman that wear many hats. Um, wow. Yes. Um, you wear so many hats. I want. I, 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 it's amazing. Do you? How do you find time to for yourself and family? I get that question all the time. It's really about setting boundaries and, of course, carving out time for important things in life and making sure that nothing overruns the other, pretty much. It's just really just managing and scheduling your time. All right, that's good. Tell us a little um, about where you, you are, where you, where you came, where you're from, where you're from you're, which we, we, we already, that's um, been known also um, that you're from Turks. But... Tell us a little bit about your childhood days in Turks, where you're from in Turks, the Turks Island. I'm from the fishing capital of South Caicos. Um, that's where my mother was born. Um, my father was born in Middle Caicos, but I always like to tell people that I had a fairy tale childhood. Um, my mother and my parents actually were very, very present. My mother, while the disciplinarian, was a cheerleader, a no nonsense person. So, you know, I think my mother created the side eye. I tell you that she was a church organist for over 60 years and she just looked at you and you straighten up in the church bench. You know, my father was a boat captain turned taxi driver and I always tell people he was my number one cheerleader. So I had a very, very present father, um, very small home, one brother, one sister. Um, I have other brothers and sisters, but that's all that grew up in the house with me. And so we had a really close knit, small family um, church was very central. Community functions were very central. My mother always volunteered in the community, and our family was a respected family um, on the island of South Caicos. Wow. You, you, I, I notice you speak a lot. And, and we're from the, I understand that background. Having a mother, um, my mother was always in church. Yes. The leadership role in church. And I, what, just one look, <laughs> we understand what yes. that means, you know? And um, the same thing that you're saying is the same to us in my family because my mother was more the disciplinary. Yes. And I think that 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 is not seen in today's home. But um, look look how you've 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 rise to the top. 
Um, well, I always I always tell people, don't blame me for being strong. A strong woman raised me. Right. So I, I really have to, you know, pay tribute to my mom in that respect. Yes, we celebrate her. You have a very strong leadership background. Who taught you how to become a leader? Um, or, or who was your role model? Your mother, you said your mother. But also, I'm sure there, there, there were other role models too. And did your parents play a very vital part in that? Yes, very much so. My mother kept me in line. Let's not forget that because I was, um, when people, when I was younger, saw say they saw leadership abilities um, within me, you have to understand there was a fight that already started. So there was a fight for me to be either a leader of good or a leader of bad. So God gave me the right mother that drove out of the, the bad out of me with a rod at times. Um, but at different stages in my life, I had different role models. And I try to tell that to young people, you know, today people look for one mentor. The truth is I've had different mentors at different stages in my life. So when I first became a Christian um, at age 15, the youth leader from my church, he was everything to me. You know, everything I, I, I needed to talk about or, you know, what I wanted to decide, whether in terms of career or my spiritual life, you know, he was that mentor and that role model for me. When I got into high school, of course, I had an, a, a, another teacher, um, Dr. Carlton Mills, who helped me even in my career path. When I got into university, um, it was Dr. Neville Duncan and Dr. Kenny Anthony, who was a former um, prime minister of St. Lucia. They were my role models. And of course, as I entered politics, the Honorable Derek Taylor, whose um, leadership I came under first as appointed member back in 1999, became my role model in, in politics. And as I, as I look around though, in terms of, of serving my community and, and giving back to, to my church um, unapologetically and taking care of my home, my number one role model will be my mother. Wow, excellent, that's amazing, that's great. Um, what, what led you, because you're, you're also an attorney by profession, yes. right? Yes. Uh, what being, uh, you, you, being that you're you, your attorney, what led you down the path to decide that you wanted to uh, become a politician? I never decided I wanted to be a politician. <laughs> sure. That's where my story gets tricky. Um, I shared, I, I actually am the lead of my youth group at church, and I was just saying to them um, just last week, we're doing career options. When I was 10, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer because I used to watch Matlock and saw him arguing cases in court. So I wanted to go in court and I wanted to argue, you know, that was my whole thing. And I mean, God really turned door. Um, he turned some keys and opened some doors for me to get through law. And it's amazing that just like graduated from Norman Manley Law School in 1998, I came home and Honorable Derek Taylor was the chief minister. And I so admired him, his honesty, his transparency, his humility. And I went straight onto the campaign trail campaigning for him. Now, if anyone passed through UE and, and passed through certain hands, Dr. Kenny Anthony or Dr. Trevor Monroe or Dr. Neville Duncan, you, you, that, that little politics yeah. trying to, we fixed every regional problem at UE at Limes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's true. We, we did. You know, so when I got home, I had that little political thing in me. My mom is very strong supporter. I mean, all my party leaders and everybody ate there. So I had that, that little, I mean, background there. But it was Derek Taylor administration that, that offered me the appointed member position. So I got home in May 1998, and by April 1999, I was sitting in the House of Assembly. It was then called the Legislative Council. And everything turned from there. Um, so the very first time I served, I served as appointed member. I eventually came up the ranks of the party, um, went to a convention in June 20, 2012, you know, intentions of being elected the deputy leader, became the deputy leader after that convention. Within six months of a general election, the leader of my party was unsuccessful and my party voted me as leader. That's how I got there. Wow. <laughs> it oh sounds God. simple, but it is such a story that my life for me seemed confused. But when I got to the place where I got, I saw all the building blocks and all the jigsaw puzzle just fitting together, you know? So I chose to be a lawyer and God chose me to serve in that way. But you know, um, um, your, your story is one, is one of amazing grace or favor 
on your mm -hmm. life because absolutely I mean, the, the, you just rose to the top quickly in the yes. politics yes. and a and a and a male dominate two of the careers are male dominated careers and I'll, I'll stop right here because i like to share this story in particular because when i graduated from high school i graduated as valedictorian and you know everybody's like okay you, you we're going to give you a scholarship because you're a top student that never materialized so i had to literally work my way through and when i got to my degree for barbados um you had to go to a campus you know mono barbados i'm barbados sorry than to do your final two years for law. I had no money because my parents had already um, helped me. Um, I had already gotten money to do so many years and they had put up their house. And Barclays Bank, where I ended up working for a year before I went off to college and then a year because I was a broke student, before I went back to university, Barclays Bank decided we're going to do scholarships, student loans, sorry, student loans. And would you know, at the end of the day, there were two loans approved in the entire region before they realized this isn't going to be profitable. And I was one of two in the entire region. Wow. Exactly. So Maybe. I don't question my path. <laughs> wow. You, you, you walk with such great favor. Yes. I have to invite you here for you to give me, to shake my hands. Or I have to come <laughs> here to shake your hands to get some of that favor. But tell us, um, what is like having such a huge such huge responsibility being also the, the premier well first you're the minister of finance right yes <laughs> minister yes of finance over the island of turks and caicos and yes. then being leader over the island it was it was it was huge <laughs> i started um nine months after i was elected we had two major hurricanes you oh. know um our revenue took a a, a serious hit um, the country, uh, every chain and every island in our chain had damages, you know, our major hotels closed. So it was really a, a challenging time. But in that experience, I've shared already with the country when I, I did my first year uh, look, looking back at Irma Maria, as I sat in that room that night and the hurricane was going on, God showed me um, a magazine with the islands. And I took oil that had been delivered to me, promised to me months before, but delivered the day before the hurricane. And I marked an X on every island. And I said to God, I will not complain, just let there be no deaths. And people could not understand the, the extent of damages in Turks and Caicos, how there were no deaths. And so of course, God opened the way. We, we, you know, we got hotels back up and running. And everything was going good. We, we were able to begin to achieve our, our, our goals. And we were rebuilding, literally, physically rebuilding Turks and Caicos because about 80% of government buildings uh, were impacted, including the majority of our schools, um, hospitals, airports, communications. And then COVID-19 hit. Oh. So my last year or so, um, I was again tightly managing the finances, but because we did such a good job of managing it, you know, we got favor from the UK, um, who is the um, I, I, I like to say the ministering power, not the parent anymore in these days. Um, we're no longer a colony, you know, and we were able to have banks run us down to lend us money even when our revenues weren't coming in as they should. So I mean, there was really, really. Um, a sound foundation in terms of our finances. And even now the current government is, is reaping the rewards of that um, and that we were able to manage and manage so carefully, but not rob or shortchange the people of the Turks and Caicos. So you, they would have seen record investment. And I've spent over a hundred million dollars in infrastructure in four years, wow. despite hurricane and a pandemic, record investment in national security, you know, increased scholarships by a million dollars in four years. You know, those sort of things um, we were able to do. Thank God for that. But it was a real difficult task because you wake up some days and you go like the weight of this country is really on your shoulder and you can't think about it. You just have to go from task to task to task because it is really a weight to carry. You were, you were born for it. Um, um, congratulations on the things that you have achieved. I can just imagine the men. <laughs> 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 
No, you, you, let, let's be let's be honest, right? Yes, and it was rough. You feel it's a male dominated, just like when in ministry you find a lot of males, right? Yes. Uh, um, um, how did you the challenges? How did you handle the challenges of um, the males? Um, you, you you're the head over the the island as the premier. How do you handle the challenges from the men who um, they weren't happy? To know that a female was giving them, you know, um, instructions of what is to be done, or a female was their leader. Well, I, I'll give you the, uh, my campaign slogan was "I'm the best man for the job." That's true. So when I ran in 2016, <laughs> my campaign slogan was "I'm just the best man for the job." Like and the that. truth is, because I didn't claw and manipulate to get out there, I worked. People just saw me as someone who worked. So even in my party that was still, it's still male dominated. Um, people just saw a worker that climbed up. I was, I can't say I was identified as a woman, right? Sometimes they would hold conversations and I go like, yes, remember I'm a female here, you know? So they got that comfortable. But then we, when I got elected, um, it was the, the, the men in my cabinet, the men in my team, um, we, we really worked extremely well together. Um, but you had, at the end of the, the, the day, person's going like, you're listening to a woman. And, you know, they would say certain things that taunt them, you know. Um, but it was rough being, it, it's, it's rough being a, a woman in a male dominated field. Um, and it is rough at the hands of women, sometimes more than the men, you know. Um, we women pick on a whole lot and we criticize a whole lot, you know, and I, I try as much as possible to to, to speak to women about lifting up other women, you know, and that's where I found my greatest challenge was really with the women. I believe you because our women are always jealous of women. Your faith is incredible. And, you know, we're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and look at that. But it's rare you meet someone with the success that you have achieved um, that speaks so much about church, about God, um, I'm, I'm tremendously blown away and impressed by that because um, as many persons um, you may know in life, many persons as they rise to the top, some people forget that there's a creator. But you, 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 you you're just in church. Um, you're, you're leading this department. Um, it's amazing. But I want to hold your thought on that. We're going to take a short break, pathway to success, and we're going to come back with the amazing Honor of um, Sean Cardwell Robinson of the Turks and Caicos. out to Mr. Max Island Grill and enjoy some of the greatest Jamaican food all around. Our address is to 400 Okeechobee Boulevard, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33409. It's the best of the best. to advertise your business? Look no further. Pathways to Success is offering three 30-second slots each Sunday of the month for $100. Please contact 561-331-1524 for all inquiries. Did you pick out this detergent all by yourself? So cute. It's half the size and it's half the plastic. And there's nothing cute about unnecessary plastic. Christy, the average person generates over 200 pounds of plastic a year. And there are 329 million of us in the U.S. alone. 
you want paper or paper? Yeah. Seven generation Easy Dose laundry detergent. Half the size, half the classic, all the clean. So where were we? The playoff. Oh, yes. Only a handful of teams remained. Hailing from kingdoms far and wide across the college football land. All vying for a spot in the playoff. Each team led by a great coach. Fearless players. And defended by the loyalist of fans. Soon they would take part in an epic playoff battle for the right to call themselves national champions. And to the victor go the sports. A beautiful trophy. A grand celebration. And bragging rights that stand the test of time. And then what happened? <laughs> we'll find out soon. Star Wars story in a new two-night adventure. You know what I've come for. Only at Walt Disney World Resort. Pathway to Success. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Hunter, and we have with us all the distinguished honor, um, distinguished honor, well accomplished. I'm um, Charlene Cartwright Robinson with us um, of the Turks and Caicos Island. Um, wow, what accomplishment. Um, this woman should be honored wherever she goes. Um, tell us, tell us about your involvement also with um with the British Charities and the Caribbean Diaspora uh, Association. The Caribbean Diaspora is a, um, something that was launched this year. Um, for, actually, it follows in the celebration of the Bahamas turning 50, and they're looking at all the nations that actually contributed to the development of the Bahamas. And I was honored to be chosen to be one of their advisors to that body. The British charity that I am president of is known as FUDBOT, which is Friends of the Overseas Territories, um, British Overseas Territories. And we focus quite a bit on the environment and raising monies to protect the environment. Um, so that is uh, that is something I'm really proud of. Yes. Uh, and, it's in its, and it's in its 10th year, just published a book and I was able to write the foreword for it. Oh, what's the topic of your book? Because you're an author, yes. No, that was that is celebrating the tenth year of um, Friends of the Overseas British Overseas Territories. So it's a charity, yes. So what's 
So you, you wear so many hats and do so much. What are the two most important things you'd like to accomplish this year? Um, there is an NGO that I've birthed. Um, it's called Impact. And it's investing, motivating, positioning, uh, uh, affirming citizens of tomorrow, impact. And what I would like to accomplish is I'd like for that to be in such a position that young people who need guidance um, know that that's a door they can walk through. Um, young men who are in prison know that that's a hand that would help. Uh, when they come out of prison, they know that's a door that they can walk through. So impact is really um, my my life's mission right now, aside from my work in my church, which is youth work still. Um, but I would like to to have that um, blossom into what I know that it, it, it can become um, here in Turks and Caicos. It's so important that we have NGOs that just focus on the future, the the development of our our youth. Uh, the next thing is my oldest daughter <laughs> travels to the UK. I just love for her to just be settled. Uh, remember, the, the, you know, the faith on which she stands and, you know, just do us all proud. So those are really the top priorities um, for, for me this year. No, you're, you're a minister of finance. And so it takes, it takes a lot to, 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 to be in that position. But it also indicates that you're a master at managing and balancing money. Can you give the viewers some tips on budgeting and how to manage their money in such in, in these hard times? But I'd say be real, be realistic, be realistic. Sometimes we 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 and we have to know that there will be variances, right? So coming from a, a minister of finance that had a hurricane that changed your budget, two hurricanes that do the pandemic that changed your budget, know that what you set can't be set in stone. But as much as possible, you must try and work towards it. But you have to allow yourself um, some joy out of it. You know, you can't just be all about light, water, rent. You know, give yourself a little treat. Because if you don't, it, you're going to crave that treat and it's going to eat bigger into your, your monies. Right? Um, but more than anything, give God in a personal capacity, give God his tenth. I don't care what's going on out in the world. And persons are saying, oh, that's an Old Testament thing. But that sacrificial, sacrificial giving, I can tell anyone, my husband and I are faithful tithers, and I can tell you, we know the goodness uh, of God in terms of, of finances, and we know that it is um, definitely linked to our tithing. So I'd say be wise in, in, in your spending, be realistic in your spending, know that anything could happen, so you must have that cushion. You have to have cushion. You have to have cushion. I don't care if you make a dollar fine a way to save 10 cents. It is so important more than anything. Save and treat yourself. Oh, I like that. I like that. Mm -hmm. Church. Wow. Church. Church, church, church. Do you preach in the do you preach at church? Do you teach at church? Um, what do you do in your church? I used to preach a lot more <laughs> before. Um, the last time I would have given a sermon was when I was leader of the opposition. You'll find in the in the in the smaller islands in Turks and Caicos, once you become a politician, they forget that you were first a child of God and still a child of God. They don't think God could keep you and save you in a politician's chair. They right. don't think so. You know, so you know, um, I, I I I would like to say I preach a sermon almost every day to my children, <laughs> regrettably for them. <laughs> you know, but, you know, I it is I, I speak a lot to 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 young people that never changed. So you know, I don't term it as, as sermons, but it's always biblically based. Right, that's good. Tell us a little bit. I mean, what do you do in your church? Um, I mean, you you you're talking about um, groups, youths, and all of that. What do, what do you do in your church? Well, even as I moved up um, in politics, I I moved up in in, in church as well. Um, You'd have heard in my bio that I was a Northern director for the Caribbean Baptist Fellowship. But at that time I served, we have 13 Baptist churches throughout the Turks and Caicos. And at that time um, I was in my 10 year term um, as youth director responsible for all the youth youth um, fellowships in Turks and Caicos under the Baptist umbrella. Um, I eventually moved up to president um, and then was able to serve as vice president of Baptist World Alliance. Um, I've, I've since, 
gone back into frontline service in my church, head of the ASHA ministry, and recently put back in um, position of leading the youth. I'm very proud of that growing ministry. Today was Youth Sunday. We had a wonderful time at church. You know, we pull out um, all those young people who don't want to be pulled out, but they got to serve and you got to start somewhere, you know. We got all the young men with their deep bass voices reading the scripture. They're nervous, but they're up there, don't know how to end it, but they're doing good. <laughs> you know? But, you know, that's that's where where I am now, um, still serving as an usher, which I absolutely love, one of my favorite ministries. Um, and then, of course, my entire family, actually, my both my daughters, my husband and I serve as ushers. And then I, I help as a, in a, I'm the leader of the youth ministry, but in a team alongside my sister, who was my actual birth sister, who is deacon responsible for that ministry. So I, I'm absolutely loving, enjoying, because she was the perfect daughter. She, my sister was born saved. She, she was baptized in holy water. You know, this one was being saved. So I feel kind of, I feel accomplished then when I could serve on the side of her in church. Wow. <laughs> The, the level of humility that you have, you know, for one who have led the beautiful island as a pre, as a premier um, 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 in, in Turks and Caicos, and one that has the humility to be an usher. Imagine going into a church that that would, that, that would have I've been tremendously blown away to go into a church and see maybe the president of the United States of America ushering persons to, <laughs> into their into their seats. Uh, I get that reaction. I get that reaction. I get that reaction. That's amazing. That, that's a great uh, um, exemplitude of Jesus' grace and his humility. And no matter, even though you have achieved so much, there's a level of humility and that still willingness to serve others. Well, I was raised in the church. I was in politics for 20 seconds compared to how long I was in the church. Oh my God. So, so my mom drilled that in us. You know, I, I say to my children, the way I was raised didn't kill me. So you're going to be raised the same way. You got to find a church ministry. You got to find a service organization. You got to play an instrument. And you better don't let me have to give you the side eye in public. <laughs> didn't kill me. I'm here. You're, you're, you're a very, one very successful woman of God. Can you tell us a little bit about the book that was written about your life and published in 2021? Yes, that was that was oh, that was that was such an honor. I I thought I was blown away when um, UE Foundation, which is my alma mater, you know, gave me an award in in New York. But when I received a call from the Caribbean criminal from the Caribbean Court of Justice. I thought it was a fluke. I didn't think it was real. They had 80 plus women that were nominated and 33, they brought it down to 33 and little old Charlene from the fishing capital in South Caicos ended up being one of the 33 women, 33 or 34 women um, selected to be honored. And, you know, they asked you, I've, I've had the honor of having the editor of one of the leading papers here, Turks and Caicos Sun, actually helped me co-write um, my biography. So it's from literally the cradle, not to the grave. There's no ending yet. Um, <laughs> that way, you know, all the way up to, you know, when I retired from politics. So it's a really, really good read. And it's amazing that I was the youngest and I actually knew the oldest honoree. She served as a magistrate, Mrs. Eno you know, Woodstock. She served as a magistrate in South Caicos. And of course, you can imagine this little girl who at 10 decides she wants to be a lawyer and saw this magistrate, you know, um, I was like, wow, I can do that. And I'm sitting in a book with her, you know, years later. It was such an honor just to be included with um, great persons like her. And of course, my my counterpart, Mia Motley, is also in the book as one, the first female um, prime minister of Barbados. And that's a very good friend of mine as well. But it, it, it really looks at our, our climb and how we contributed to our country and our region. So it celebrates all aspects of our, our lives. It's really, really, really a good um, initiative by the Caribbean Criminal Court of Justice for female jurists. Yeah. We, we, I'm, I'm where, uh, our viewers watching, I mean, they would like to get a copy. How can they get it? From the CCJ, you can actually go online and you can order it. Okay, from CCJ. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, are you are you currently working on any big pro um, um, projects um, right now? No, I'm I'm still just thawing out. <laughs> thawing out. I say to people that oh, are no. like, oh, you're, you're resting too long. I said no. I'm I'm actually enjoying adulthood. Um, like I said to you, when I came fresh out of law school, I went straight into politics. This is actually the first time, really, in my adulthood that I I have time for me, and and there's no politics or or, or anything of that sort. So I've been doing quite a bit of personal projects, construction projects, um, and then of course, just you know, spending time with my my family. Um, does the political hitch comes back on you? Um, no, no. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Oh. I I I feel, I feel, I feel that you know, there are seas. I I really believe in seasons. Yeah. I honestly, sincerely believe in seasons. And I, I can't understand how sometimes people just can't let go and move on, yeah. right? Um, I'm at peace. I'm at peace with where I am and where I want to go with my NGO. Um, and I'm at peace with, with, with the fact that I'm not in frontline politics. Of course, I get interested in the issues. Of course, I celebrate when my work continues. You know, I, of course, you know, I reach out to persons and I say, you know, this is something you need to pay attention to. And I do that even for the, the current government that is not um, my party, right? Because the politics is one thing, but love of country does not die because you retire and out of politics. So I still do, I write a weekly column. I've been writing the column for more than a year. I've, I've been touching on social issues and people will see a theme coming more and more from me. Um, and most people know that I, I have a weak spot for, for prisoners. I believe we have a captive audience and I think we, we have an opportunity to change lives and locking them up and not giving them the rehabilitative programs to make them more successful entrance into um, society is really a flaw on our part. It's a fault of society. And we create that revolving door for prison. But I, I believe that people find my, my, my commentary, my column very measured very thought, um, thought properly thought through. It's not political at all, um, but it's it has a heavy tint of education because I've been around the blocks for so long. I have a whole lot of history um, still in my head on a whole lot of issues. And I'm also able to say what I did, right? So it isn't like a promoting myself because I'm not campaigning, <laughs> you know, but also, you know, just letting people know how things work, you know, how, I faced it. Um, what possibly should be doing now is not an advisory column to the government, but it's a private citizen, a free private citizen <laughs> after how many years, you know, being able to speak on any topic. And, and I do that. I do that. You must have tried. How many countries have you been to? Pardon me? How many countries have you been to? Oh, quite a number. <laughs> Oh, wow, a whole lot. Uh, the majority of the Caribbean islands, Europe, uh, quite a number. I, I've, I've, quite, I've traveled quite a bit. And when I served even as um, as premier, but even in the overseas countries and territories association, um, I was able to move around a bit as well. Um, so I, I've, I've seen quite a bit. I've seen quite a bit for my few years in, uh, on this earth. <laughs> have you ever been to a, a country that you say, oh, Maybe I would have lived there. Um, I would trade in where I'm living now for there. No. No. Really? No. No. <laughs> no. I've never. I think because I I am such a big mouth, and I'm so opinionated. I think if I'm going to give an opinion, I better do it in the comfort of my own yard. You know. <laughs> I. I've never. And I, I. You know. I've never really traveled somewhere and go like, boy, I could live here. You know, I go places and I love it. My family and I, we always take vacations that are so important to do, you know. Um, and when I've spent my money, I'm ready to come home, <laughs> you know. But I, I, I love where I live. I love where I'm from. And I see so much potential, you know. I, I see so much in our young people. I, I see so much for, for us as a nation, you know. And I, I just want to be a part of it, sitting on the sidelines, writing my column, doing my NGO, I'm through my church, and I'm, I'm quite content.
Now, I've never been to Turks Island, but I was told that you don't have McDonald's, you don't have... No, we don't do fast foods. Our fast uh, food is seafood. Seafood. Yes. And, and I was told that there's not much... I don't know through this. I, I want to ask you as a family mm -hmm. former Korean premier, because what happened, I always say that a nation is, is shaped mo most of the time by the leaders. You know, yes. You need to be put in place for the youths to enjoy um, 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 life. But I was told, I don't know true, uh, I've never been there, but I was told that there's no like movie theater there, that sort of stuff. There used to be, but we have Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think any movie theater would survive right now when you could just snap your finger and get Netflix from the comfort, <laughs> and get co from the comfort of your home. We used to have a movie theater though. It is a business venture um, that people continue to toy with. You know, um, and, and I'd, I'd say, you know, that that is probably a hole in entertainment that you see somewhere else. But it, it didn't last very long here in Turks and Caicos. I mean, I've never been there. Yes, but you need to come. It's well, beautiful. Well, well, what can I expect? I, I'm, you're a great representative of the, of, of, of the nation. I've been tremendously impressed. But say, for example, I'm coming there. And I want to find entertainment. What can I do on that? Well, it depends on it depends on what type of entertainment you are looking for, right? Um, we always have some sporting something that's going on. Um, there are nightclubs, there are lounges. Um, we do have um, other events, but mostly people come to Turks and Caicos with our beach in mind. So nobody looking for night entertainment because you're already beat out after you would have been on our pure white sand and have those toes buried in that sand and that beautiful sun that shines different in Turks and Caicos. You're not thinking about no night activity after that. You just want to relax after having a wonderful day on the world's best beaches. I, I love that. I, I, I like karaoke. Do you have that there? Karaoke, yes. I actually have a karaoke machine in my house that you can take part in when you come. <laughs> I love karaoke. Let's sing together with your family when I get there. <laughs> oh, yes. We, we, we had karaoke the last couple of Sundays. My yeah. kids, everybody, we just sing. Where do you see yourself in the next five years, Your Honor? Uh, the next five years, definitely in Turks and Caicos. Um, definitely a mother of graduates from university who don't need any monies from me. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Um, definitely still working in the community, um, in my church, but definitely my NGO. I, I, I just want that to just balloon, you know, and I, I really want it to be something that alters um, Turks and Caicos. Well, thank you so much. The accomplished, the distinguished, the Honorable, uh, <laughs> I'm so impressed, Charlene Cartwright Robinson, um, the, the most successful uh, woman that I've um, interviewed. I, I really believe on Pathway to Success and we've really interviewed many powerful people. But you have been an outstanding standout and um, your level of humility <laughs> um, and still what I like, what, what I like so much about you um, is that church was instilled with, in you from your yes. youth. And even though you walk in success, today you're still in church. I yes. must applaud you. <laughs> Keep up the good work. God bless you. God bless you. Charlotte Cartwright Robinson. And thank you so much for coming on Pathway to Success and just taking, a, taking us with, with you through that amazing journey of favor and blessing that God has given unto you. Yes, indeed. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me. And it was great. It was great. I'm looking forward to see you soon by visiting your island. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll hold the karaoke. I'll, I'll warm up the karaoke machine for you. Oh, please do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And to all our viewers, if you desire success, seek a greater being, God, have God in your life. Yes. And God and, and exercise the gift that God has given unto you and you'll become successful. Have a great week from Rapid Success.